The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Hello again, wrestling fans. Jason Bryant here with you with episode 618 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. Today, we'll be talking with the new Beat the Streets Director of Wrestling and Enrichment, Mike Dixon. He's a guy that I go way back with since his uh, long tenure as the associate head coach at my alma mater of Old Dominion. We'll touch on that situation, but mainly we'll get into why Mr. Mike Dixon left ODU, the beach, to go to his alma mater in Indiana to work with the new head coach, Angel Escobedo, and then a year later, it says, I'm on the move. I am going to take over what's building at Beat the Street Chicago. Going to have a lot of fun with that. Before we get to that, there are some topics to discuss, and some of that directly relates to you, the listener here, the longtime subscriber, the wrestling aficionado, the person who cannot get enough wrestling news. Now, there are several things that I deliver for you for free. There are also several things I deliver based on whether it be a Patreon contribution at matttalkonline.com slash join the team or... Or you subscribe to my Rockfin channel at rokfin.com slash Online. Rockfin's kind of been a topic in the news the last week because the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club not only started a channel, but they ran an event streamed live through their channel at Rockfin on September 19th. This was an international style dual meet, basically Nittany Lion Wrestling Club versus the world, well, or they have some wrestlers from the world. So uh, I guess, you know, it was an NLWC duel. Jeff Byers and David Taylor on the call had a chance to watch it. And there are some misconceptions that are that are floating out there. One, Rockfin is not a content provider in the terms of how Flow Wrestling or Track Wrestling send a crew out. Or they they have these streaming ideas and run events. They don't run events. Rockfin's basically like a YouTube, a Twitch. It's a platform where you can deliver it. This is where I deliver content. And I also deliver it through the Patreon campaign right now because... Uh, you know, if some people want to do this, they want to do that. I'm giving you the option of how you want to consume my content. And that has been a bit of a discussion point from Kale Sanderson and such about how other Rockfin creators were promoting the event. And you can use air quotes around promoting. It, it depends on how you view it. When I promoted the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club event, I would go to Rockfin's channel. I would go to the article that they had about the event promoting it. I would click the share button. When I click that share button, and I primarily use Twitter, that is probably my social media medium of choice because I, I, I do a little bit of personal stuff on Instagram. The Matt Tuck Online account is still kind of growing with some historical stuff as I go through the old pages of amateur wrestling news, etc. But for the most part, I'm going to social it on Twitter. Now, when I hit that share button on Rockfin, the tweet will come up and it will have an affiliate ID on the end of it. So that means whoever signs up through the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club knows that they came through my link. So there is an affiliate that I get a benefit of. Now, if you're wondering, how do I support you? Okay, well, you support me by joining Rockfin at my channel at Matt Talk Online. If you wanted to join the Nittany Lion, you would do at NLWC. The benefit of if you're a wrestling junkie, you're going to get at least at minimum, I think we're of 50 plus content creators on the Rockfin platform. I get benefit. If you sign up under, say, Willie, and then you read my stories that are on the premium side of thing. I'm going to get credit for you reading those premium stories. It is how the whole system works. Basically, we are going to, if we share each other's content and we get eyes on each other's content and people go from one story to the next to each other's comp- content, we all kind of win as content creators because in the podcast industry, there is a big kerfuffle about YouTube deplatforming people or removing people that from a monetization value, if they don't have over a thousand subscribers, basically, if you're a little guy, YouTube gives two craps about you. You have to be huge for YouTube to care. So I'm not huge. I don't put my video stuff on YouTube. So uh, when we come to what type of value you get from my perspective, from you listening to this show, you like this show, you like this network, you know that there's something I provide that you are willing to contribute or pay for. Both formats work for me, Patreon and Rockfin. Now, I will say my video content is going to start moving towards Rockfin. I'm going to be doing these watch-alongs and things of that nature when we get to the season, when we have people to talk about actual wrestling events with. 
We're not there yet. I did a, a kind of a full watch along playing with a Facebook room for the Flow Wrestling event with Chimizo and Dake, just kind of testing the waters since I've, I've been still working on getting that thing set up and I'm using this program called StreamYard, which works really well. This last week, I, I didn't do that because I wanted to sit and watch the event and it, it blew through and I watched Wrestling Underground on UFC Fight Pass. I watched Rumble and Rooftop on Fight. I watched the NLWC on their channel on Rockfin. So um, to get back to it, I'm going to do watch-alongs and things like that on Rockfin. They will not be put out on YouTube, or if they're on Facebook Live, they're probably going to be taken out, because the value is, is that if you want to be participating in it, you're going to be there. That's that's the platform. Now, a lot of my historical stuff, articles, they're going to be both Patreon and Rockfin. If I record a show live, I'm recording shows live, like this show I did with Mike Dixon, I recorded uh, about a week before it was released. Now, you get the video. You One, you can see it live on the Rockfin channel. You can also see the archived video on Rockfin. Now, whether or not I produce that show right then and there, you're going to get it early there. You're going to get the audio early with your own private RSS feed if you're a patron and you contribute to the Matt Talk Podcast Network in that regard. And those shows are all ad-free. So as you heard, there was a pre-roll here. There's going to be a mid-roll before I get into the interview. And then there's going to be a post-roll at the end of the show. If you subscribe through Patreon and you want the RSS feed of it of this show, you're you're gonna get the ad stripped out. That's you know, Conrad Thompson, a professional wrestling podcaster, has this thing called ad free shows. Well, yeah, I'm not gonna steal his moniker by any means, but they are gonna be ad free shows. So that is what you also get. Now the written content, that goes both places. Now, charts and historical stuff, that there's gonna be some charts that go in the rock fin and things that are that I dig up historically. Then there's going to be stuff that is accessed through only your membership through Mad Talk Online, which is like my sandbox of results, my results repository, so to speak. So uh, what you don't get in those results, you're going to get with your Rockfin subscription. You're going to get Willie. You're going to get PA Power. You're going to get IA Russell. I would say if you're a huge junkie of all wrestling content, I would recommend going the Rockfin route. If you specifically like what I do and you want to support me, I am overly thankful and gracious for that because there have been people that have come and gone. I thank you. We've had people that have been contributing for five and six years at this point. And, you know, they, you know, COVID is, is what it is. And people have had to make some financial changes, you know, no hard feelings. I, I, I thank you for the long time that you did support the show. I also welcome new people to come in and support. You'll get a shirt, you'll get a draft class, you'll get the digital preview guides, depending on your level of contribution. So there, there are various ways to help me out in the way I've had to basically, I've, I've become a third grade teacher for half the week for my, my, my eight-year-old. So there's a lot of stuff that's not going to be coming out as fast and furious as I want it to, but I'm also still working heavily behind the scenes. Like right now, I'm tracking the historical conference records. I mean, I know there's some people out there that do stuff about uh, drop projects and stuff. Well, I've got more information than anyone else on the planet, and I just need to transcribe it. I just need to digitize it. And that is what I'm doing, and that is where your contributions to both of those platforms go to help. Because when I come up with something, it's going to get put out. It's going to be original. It's not going to be anything you have ever seen before, unless maybe you were a 75-year-old subscriber to Amateur Wrestling News, and you've got a Rockfin subscription, and you you know contribute to the Matt Talk Podcast Network. So, Long story short, to tell you about, that's the stuff that I have on my network for you. Then, if you're a Rockfin contributor, you get these other content creators. And some of them, there are, there are a lot of wrestling outlets out there that, that are on the platform. Like, oh, that's, a little, that's, that's a little too nuanced for me. Or I don't need that list. Or I don't need, I don't need no offense, I don't need New Jersey High School State rankings. So I'm not going to necessarily follow for full circle. But I am interested in Pennsylvania high school rankings because I lived in Pennsylvania for three years. I know what they're doing with the, the sanctioned PA movement. Eric Knopsnyder and Jeff Upson have shows on my network from PA Power. So I'm interested in Pennsylvania high school stuff. Same with IA Russell. I'm working the night of conflict coming up here at the end of the week for the girls and boys wrestling events out there in Sioux City. I'm paying attention to what's going on in the border state of Iowa. So there are different things for me as a consumer that I'm going to check off. Okay, I don't I don't need to necessarily read this. So click off this, click off this, click off this, follow this, follow this, follow this. You get a lot of lot of value for your money if you're a content junkie. If you're a live streaming junkie and you're looking for live video events, I think that's up to, again to the the individual content provider to provide. It's not like Rockfin's going to put up this schedule of here's all our events. Now, they may eventually I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. This is this is a guess because I know they're in litigation right now and there's a lot of things they wish they could do that they can't right now. 
But my, my estimation is maybe they put up a This Week on Rockfin if they talk to some of their creators on, hey, I Russell's going to do this dual meet. PA Power is going to do this dual meet. That, that's maybe what can happen. So uh, if you're look, I, I will say if you're looking for live cover, like live event stuff, like live video, I don't think that's where the, the, the platform you're going to be looking for. If you're looking for general wrestling content, historical articles, recaps, rankings, you know, uh, obviously I don't have to tell you about Willie's content. He's kind of dialed into the recruiting scene. So if you're into that stuff, that's all for the nine ninety nine a month. And well, the question is, 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 is again, the residual. So if you, you subscribe and you keep subscribing. We benefit. We all benefit. And the value of that token, uh, the coin, whatever you want to call it, that value goes up. So that also helps us continue to put content up because if we're seeing value, on the subscriber side, we're going to keep giving you value as the consumer, as the fan, as the patron. So that's just a little bit of the, how the sausage is made from where I sit on how you can help this network and and what everything has, has gone around. Because I wasn't trying to siphon off anybody. I didn't siphon off anybody. I didn't even promote to sign up for me to watch this. I had affiliate links. I had a couple people sign up. But all of them had been patrons, either previous Patreon contributors like uh, Mark Kozik. He's back on. He's back on. Cool. Thanks. So all that information on how you can contribute, you can go to com slash contribute. Or if you want to go straight to the Patreon, mattalkonline.com slash join the team. That's a lot of behind the scenes, how the sausage is made, I realize. But I felt it was necessary. Now we move to our next segment. I'm going to stick to this segment twice in a row. It's, uh, I don't know. WTF map moments. I don't know. But anyway, here we go. And it's not really the, the, the most fun thing to talk about. But in 2005, Mercyhurst Northeast and Spartanburg Methodist each had their program's first NJCAA place winners. Maryland native Corey Bowers finished sixth at 125 pounds for Mercyhurst Northeast, while South Carolina native Charles Bugarin was Spartanburg Methodist's first NJCAA place winner. Sadly, both programs ended after the 2019-2020 season as Mercyhurst Northeast's scheduled closure was accelerated due to financial issues related to COVID-19, and Spartanburg Methodist's administration dropped the sport, citing lack of regional competition. As always, I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me because you've always got time for short time. Let's talk to Mike Dixon after the swoosh. I'd like to welcome you to episode 618 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. I'm Jason Bryant. News, reviews, previews, and interviews as we are recording live here on Rockfin and on Facebook Live with the Speakeasy Live, if you will, and my guest, my longtime friend, and connoisseur of mustaches, even though he doesn't sport one. Currently, he is the new director of wrestling and enrichment at Beat the Streets Chicago. I know him as Donatello. You know him as Mike Dixon. And he's a huge Cubs fan. So we're going to throw a lot of inside jokes at you. But there's some real business to talk to, Dixon. Good to see you, man. It is always a pleasure to see you, speak with you, be around you. There's a lot of things that uh, you also have to pay me off to not say on this episode. We'll leave. We'll, we'll work about where to send the check after that. But uh, before we get into you know what led you to beat the streets, Chicago, uh, you get an interesting wrestling background. You wrestled in the Big Ten. Uh, you actually played some football as well, so you did a little bit of that two sport thing. A little bit of an international career, then getting to coaching. But uh, what was the first thing that actually drew you to the sport of wrestling way back in the day? Uh, to be honest with you, I got a late start uh, into wrestling. I didn't start wrestling until my sophomore year uh, of high school. And uh, to be honest with you, um, I was just trying to get good at football. And I had a football coach. Thankfully, he said, if you want to get good at football, you need to go wrestle. Uh, so I moseyed on down to the wrestling room. And I mean, just like anybody else in their first year, take a lot of butt kickings. And uh <clears throat> At the end of the year, uh, when the varsity was prepared for postseason, he was kind of like letting the JV go. And uh, he said, you know, you guys, your season's done. And I went up and asked the coach, I said, hey, do you mind if I just keep working out with the varsity guys? You know, Uh, he said, you know, by all means. Um, So I, you know, just continued, got better, got better over the summer. And um, in a short time, I was able to get somewhat decently good, I guess, uh, good enough to at least uh, get a scholarship to Indiana University. Um, I was fortunate. I had <clears throat> two pretty good workout partners uh, in high school, uh, Will Hill, Vernon Cannon. Um, 
and there was several other guys in the room, but those two guys ended up wrestling Division One at uh, Central Michigan and Michigan State. So uh, butt kickings daily in that practice room probably helped lead me and prepare me to uh, probably a lot of where I am today. What was what was your understanding of the college wrestling scene before you went to Indiana? I mean, we we talk about people that I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know you know Big Ten, whatever. Uh, what was your your understanding of how the college wrestling world worked in Division One? I knew nothing about it. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I showed up. Uh, you know, like I said, I was fortunate enough to you know get a little bit of money, uh, go to Indiana, and uh, I knew Iowa was good. That was was about it. And I was, you know, I mean, growing up, I'd always like played baseball, football. um, And, you know, I was watching those sports and, you know, I I thought I was a good football player. You know, I was all state. I thought I was good enough to uh, play D1 football. But little I know, somebody that's 5'11", it's not going to, unless you're incredibly fast, you're not playing D1 football. So uh, fortunately, this is the path that, uh, was provided for me and uh, I was able to take advantage of what I could. And, you know, here I am uh, 20 some years later, or maybe almost 30 years later, 24, 25 years later, later. Yeah. We're, we're all aging out of that demographic. I mean, (laughs) I mean, you, you've, you've gone, you've got, you you took care of the baldness years ago. I'm starting to deal with it in my early forties here. Yeah. um, I mean, since we've known each other since we were both in our twenties, which is kind of scary to think about that we're adults. Well, (laughs) Maybe. Allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. And w- w- what's interesting about when you when I, when we talk to people that discover wrestling late and then they they concentrate on wrestling when they get into college, how much of a, of an athletic gain did you make with your technique once you concentrated on wrestling full time in college? Uh, in the beginning, it was a little rough, but um, I, I think I got a lot away with a lot of stuff younger because I was pretty strong uh, for just in general and for my size, so. Um, I would say in the beginning, I relied a lot on strength, um, but obviously uh, when you get to college, especially wrestling in the Big Ten, you realize it doesn't matter how strong you are. That has very little to do with uh, re- wrestling, you know. Uh, so that's when you had to get into technical development, and I was fortunate enough at Indiana. We had Jason Kelber's assistant, Lenny Zaleski, Mike Mena, uh, Moran Karchalava, you know, <clears throat> We had a lot of great assistants. Uh, Dwayne Goldman was the head coach there. Um, so I was surrounded by a lot of great people that had excelled at a high, high level and just trying to learn and observe from them. And you know, I was fortunate enough I, there. I had uh, some decent workout partners, and I had some people that had been wrestling uh, for a long time that were able to kind of help guide me and show me some things. Because like I said, I went to college. I, I, I knew very little, to be honest with you. So. You mentioned Mike Mena, and everybody's got a good Mike Mena story. Some might have more than others. Um, I got two of them. One, and these are the PG Mike Mena version. So we're at the Virginia <laughs> Duels one year, and my high school teammate was was pretty good. A guy named Sean Gillespie ended up wrestling at the Apprentice School, uh, won an NCWA title back in the in the early part of the 2000s. That part's not really important. I just wanted another Pocosin plug into the show. Well, it's the Virginia Duels, and the after parties were kind of legendary there for a long, long time. And uh, I think Gillespie looks at Mena, and they, they just kind of have this stare down. And there, there may have been libation shared at, at, at the time, but Mena goes, who is that guy? And it's like, he's like, I'm thinking he's going to go after him. He goes, he looks tough. I want him in Indiana. It's just so everybody that would pass him uh, would be like, uh, he looks tough. I want him in Indiana. And then years later, we're in Vegas at, uh, at whatever that hotel is named. It's been the Hilton. It's been the LVH. It's been Westgate. Uh, you probably know which one at the, at the Cliff Keen tournament. And the uh, he goes, Brian, you got to get a story right, man. You're 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 an all American heavyweight from all American from. Um, um, and he looks around, and and Jason Ramstetter is walking right by at the same time. He goes, Adam State, that's your deal. You're from Adam State. So from for years on out, I just look at him and go, Adam State, and he chuckles. So those are the two probably most podcast friendly versions. Give me give me a good Mike Menace story. Maybe maybe when you realize that this guy's this guy's a little different. Well, uh, probably day one at school, right? <laughs> well, like you said, the uh, probably the story I could tell. Um, <laughs> I, I, 
frequently remember. So when, when he came to Indiana, he was still, you know, training and uh, trying to make a world and Olympic team. And uh, we had some pretty brutal practices at Indiana. Uh, but I would always remember Mena after practice is done, hard practice, you know, we're, you know, cooling down. And here comes Mena in his workout gear. I call it workout gear, but <clears throat> it was basically just some briefs. And he'd always grab a little guy and some poor – Little guy, after probably a two-hour hard grind, probably had another hour, hour and a half workout with Mike Mena. Um, and I just get, remember kept looking. I'm like, man, <laughs> I feel sorry for those little guys. So he 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 was uh, he was relentless, but I think he was a good balance uh, for what we had in the room, and he kept everything light. Uh, he was easy to uh, come to, uh, and he, he he's an excellent coach. You know, obviously, Angel Escobedo, Joe Dubuque, and uh, several other guys that were able to ex- excel uh, under uh, his tutorship. So uh, he's a fantastic person, a great coach, and you know I got nothing good, good things to say about him. Got a lot of funny stories to say about him too. And one thing, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. Now, one thing you said you talk about the balance. A lot of people don't know much about Dwayne, which was interesting. Is uh, when the Big Ten Network did the uh, you know the kind of the behind the scenes thing about you know all the, the the outside stuff that he likes to do and you know the outdoors and you know the, just the the land and such. What what was something about Dwayne that that kind of surprised you as you got to know him over the years? Uh, Dwayne's a great guy and, uh, he's really big into family. Uh, he was always having the team over his house. Uh, I remember we used to go out to the Olympic training center. Uh, his parents, uh, lived out there as well. Uh, and they were always welcoming to us. Uh, we'd have dinners out there. Uh, so he, <clears throat> he was a big family person. I mean, his kids are grown now, but, uh, at the time I was in Indiana, they're very, very little and they routinely come on trips with us. So, uh, you know, he was very good at involving his family into the program and kind of get, getting to know the other side out. Uh, not just I'm just a coach, but here I am um, in, in my role as a husband, father. Now we talk about your career, your career ends at Indiana, then you get into coaching and uh, your first stop, I believe, if you correct me if I'm wrong, was the University of Indianapolis, the Greyhounds, and you spent a little bit of time there. Uh, before heading on to the Division One ranks, what did you what did you kind of take away from your time in Division Two at University of Indianapolis? Uh, at the time, uh, actually, kind of going back. So after I graduated from Indiana, I stayed and kind of helped out and uh, was training a little bit. Uh, then I had an opportunity to uh, coach at a high school uh, the year before Indianapolis, so I did that. And then my old high school coach was the head wrestling coach at the University of Indianapolis. So that's how I got connected there. And probably the biggest thing I noticed from day one is I didn't realize um, there was a big difference between Division II and Division One. i I'd been used to being in a Big Ten room five years. I thought wrestling was the same pretty much everywhere. Um, then I kind of realized that um, there were different levels. So I was exposed to that at uh, the Division II level. Um, and fortunately, uh, <clears throat> there was guys, I mentioned Will Hill earlier. He was, uh, helping out a little bit at university of Indianapolis. And we had some guys from Purdue helping out in Indianapolis too. Uh, so I think what we were able to do is take a lot of kind of the work ethic and what it takes to excel at a high level and bring that to that level. And I think a lot of guys kind of had some instant success, even though I was there for a short period of time, but. Uh, at the time, that was the best season they'd had uh, in quite some time. And I think it was just we had a bunch of young and hungry, fresh out of college guys that, you know, I mean, it was great. You got to work out in every day and you were kind of beating up on some guys. So <laughs> is it true that you get so much better at wrestling as soon as you get done competing on the college? Oh, that, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the second you're done, <laughs> the second you're done, you're always like, why didn't I do this like three years ago? Because you, you you might not have known that three years ago. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, when we first crossed paths, uh, you're coaching at James Madison, which at the time had a program in uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia. How did you end up at JMU? I mean, that's it's it's from a from a high school perspective, it was a it was one of my choices that I was looking at. It's in a great area at the time. It had a pretty competitive wrestling program, and then they they dropped a lot of the scholarships for for those programs that they ultimately cut. But uh, how, how do you end up in Harrisonburg from Indianapolis? Uh, <clears throat> so 
at Indianapolis, I kind of realized I did want to coach. I kind of caught the coaching bug, if you will. But I didn't want to do it at the Division II level. I, I felt I wanted to be at the highest level. Um, and fortunate, one of the guys that was in the room um, was a Purdue grad. Uh, and one of his teammates happened to be the head coach at James Madison at the time. And he knew I was kind of looking for an opportunity. Uh, he placed a phone call. I applied for the job, and it, it was basically it was a part time job as a stipend. So I I don't even remember how much I was making back then. To be honest with you, it was I mean I was able to share a room, and I lived on a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at the time. But I knew it was my opportunity to get into Division One, and you know I, I wasn't a big name by any means, so I knew I was going to have to work and grind my way up to uh, get to the Division One level. So uh, that was an opportunity. I took it and. I didn't know anybody in Virginia. I didn't have any connections in Virginia. Uh, the head coach was Josh Hutchins. He happened to wrestle at, at uh, Purdue. So, uh, and we really didn't even know each other that well. Uh, we were both from Indiana, but uh, we we had some common friends. And, um, you know, I took a leap of faith, and he took a leap of faith on me. And uh, I was only there for a year, but I, I, I think we had at least started to lay some type of foundation for uh, given the resources uh, what that program was able to uh, a- a- achieve. And like you said, uh, when I got there, the scholarships were scrapped. Uh, the recruiting budget was $500. Um, you know, it, it was not in a great situation to be able to excel, but uh, with what we had, you know, we tried our best. So, uh, but like you said, it's it's a gorgeous area out there. You've got the Shenandoah Mountains out there. The campus is beautiful. Um, I always tried to sell it to kids that it, had a large female to male ratio. Uh, <laughs> As I said, it was enticing <laughs> for the high school students. So, I mean, and, yeah. and from my perspective, they had a really good communications uh, department too. So that's one thing that I was, I was eyeing it. And, but obviously it wasn't the wrestling part of it, but the, the opportunity to get the coaching, you say you get that coaching bug. And then all of a sudden word is kind of around. I mean, how long does it take for word to get around that this guy's a good heavyweight coach. What makes a heavyweight coach, upperweight coach different than say a lightweight coach and not, not just, you know, in the, the tactics, but maybe the mentality and, and how you got to get somebody amped up. I mean, you prepare heavyweights a little different than lightweights. Is that tr- a true or false statement? Uh, I, I think it's evolved to be honest with you. And it's certainly a lot different now than what it was even 10 years ago. Um, but I mean, quote unquote heavyweight coach. I, I kind of look at it, if you're a coach, you're a coach. Mm-hmm. You know, you you should be able to adapt and coach any weight classes. Um I I would say 10 plus years ago, uh, a lot of the heavyweights were uh good athletes that they probably played football for three to four months of the season. They wrestled for three to four months and they were probably doing something else in the spring. So where you're dealing with the lightweights where all they've done is wrestled for 12 months a year for 10 plus years, you know, so that their technical ability is, you know, out the roof. You bring in a lot of the upper weights, you know, especially during my era and before where they didn't quite have all that mat time technical experience. So uh, it's trying to catch them up to that, you know, um, trying to close that gap as quickly as you can, you know, which takes a lot of work, dedication. And then obviously when you're going through technique, I mean, there probably are some things that um, bigger guys aren't necessarily going to be able to adapt to as easily. Um, you know, so there might be some things that you may have to tweak here or there, but, you know, as a coach, it's always finding out, okay, what, what works best for the athlete, you know? So I've, I've always tried to deal with that and uh, you know, it, it's not a situation where heavyweights it's just go over the corner and, you know, do what you can and let's hope for the best. You know, you actually want to involve them and uh, actually teach them wrestling, you know. Um, and by the end of their careers, you know, like I said, er- early it might take them a little bit longer, but they will excel uh, as you get later on in the program. And any coach will tell you he- heavyweight's one of the hardest ways to recruit. And if you can get one that can actually do some damage for you, uh, that's a game changer, to be honest with you. It's a game changer. So um, be, being able to uh, try and get guys to get to an elite, elite level very quickly, that's something you know I've tried to do throughout my career. 
Yeah, there's always been some examples like uh, like take uh, take JMU uh, Chris Civitan. You said it was probably you know year after your your ODU we'll get to that in a second. You're, I'm like who's your who's who's their best wrestler? He goes probably Civitan. You know, it's a guy that didn't have a whole lot of credentials coming in, and you you helped him become a pretty pretty serviceable Division One heavyweight and a national qualifier, I believe, at one point in his career. Yeah, I I'd, <clears throat> I had moved on to ODU by the time he had qualified for nationals, but uh, I was happy to have. The seed was planted. <laughs> Give yourself credit. <laughs> the seed was planted, uh, if, if you can call it that. But, yeah, uh, I can't remember. It was the year after I left where he had uh, qualified for nationals. But I was happy to see him at nationals. Uh, I knew the kid had a lot of ability. Like I said, it's just kind of t- tapping into that. And uh, they're, they're going to need a lot of personal attention. Guys that don't have a lot of experience but got a lot of uh, attention, you're going to have to kind of delve into them, you know. So th- they're going to take a lot of time, you know. But – like I said, he was end up able to be a national qualifier, and he was a guy that was about two thirty or so, uh, could move very well, um, had a couple things they did well, and we just tried to capitalize on that. Now the opportunity to come to Norfolk and a guy named Steve Martin. So uh, <laughs> let's let's set the table here. Gray Simons retires my senior year at ODU, two thousand three, two thousand four. So that with him, that was uh, was the last year of the coaching staff was Gray, uh, my roommate Jeff Rusak, and the late Jamie Kelly. Then Steve Martin, local high school coach, gets the job. A lot of success at Great Bridge was an All American in Iowa. His first staff is Lee Pritz, who is now at Arizona State. Corey Ace, who's uh, he's married with a bunch of kids now in Missouri somewhere. He was an All-American at Edinburgh. And John Testa, who was an All-American at Clarion. Well, Testa was there for just one year, and then he – I think he went fishing in the mountains or something. I don't think I've seen or heard from him since. But you get the you get the uh, the spot there. And Corey Ace told me, he goes, that's who Steve's going to get for that job. Because once we, once they knew John was leaving, he was like, he's going to get the guy from JMU. Watch. Sure enough, on a trip back down to Virginia on Martin's farm, there's Mike Dixon – <laughs> set to go and and how does how does steve martin convince you to come to norfolk because a lot of people's first impressions of steve usually doesn't say i'm gonna go work with that guy <laughs> uh <clears throat> so i didn't really know steve um which you had which is something you had going for you <laughs> <laughs> i suppose so um <clears throat> i guess to give it some background information so my first year at James Madison was Steve's first year at Old Dominion. Um, recruiting wise, I'd mentioned we didn't have much of a recruiting budget. So I knew recruiting wise at James Madison, we had to stay very, very regional because I, I couldn't even fly anybody in, you know, if I, if I wanted to. So um, there were some kids that, ODU was recruiting, uh, and at the time, Virginia Tech was recruiting as well. So this was uh, Tom Brands' first year at Virginia Tech as well. Um, and obviously, those are the bigger names, the bigger splashes, I.O. backgrounds. And they're trying to invigorate life into their respective programs. But uh, there were some Virginia kids that uh, we had stayed on uh, for quite a bit. We'd been pretty, pretty persistent, and um, we were able to get those kids um, – I mean, because for us, they were walk-ons just like everybody else. You know, Tech had offered them a walk-on spot, and so did Old Dominion. But you would you would think the kids would go to the bigger school um, if, if they were walking on to each institution. But they chose James Madison, and um, I, I think that kind of attracted Steve a little bit. But I guess my only tie to Steve would have been uh, Dwayne Goldman, my head coach in college, uh, was teammates with Steve for, I believe, I believe it was only a year, but they were teammates at Iowa for a year. So I guess, I guess to link it all, that was kind of the only connection, but I'd seen Steve a lot throughout the year. Uh, Cause JMU, we were in the same conference as old dominion, the CAA. Um, and we had a few great bridge wrestlers on the team. So he'd always ask how those guys were doing. And uh, we were both at tournaments, and I know it was his first year, and he was probably frustrated, and I'm frustrated because, you know, we, we want to be successful and, you know, uh, compete at a high level, and uh, neither one of us were there yet. Um, and I just remember uh, he just kind of mentioned to me, we might have a job opening. Would you be interested? And, you know, I kind of said absolutely. And uh, I knew Pritz a little bit. I, I did know Pritz a little bit at the time. Um, you know, so we talked to Pritz, and uh, – you know, things just kind of worked out and, you know, I got a long lasting friendship relationship with Steve. And like I said, um, he, he's a very, very passionate, uh, person. 
but he's a very loyal, very caring person. Um, but you, you know, his, his passion, <laughs> not everybody could take the passion, but, uh, the people that know him truly and dearly will, will tell you he, he's a genuine person. And, um, I mean, he's, he's going to tell you exactly what he feels, you know, but, um, as, as long as you can understand that, um, uh, you know, he's good. I always said it takes a different type of wrestler or a certain type of wrestler to wrestle for Steve. It's, it, it probably has to take a certain type of coach to work with him as well. So, uh, it was one thing is, is when you got, you started getting pulled away, you started getting offers and, and people started to see what you were doing at Old Dominion with Steve Martin. Of course, the program went from no all Americans from 1995 until James Nicholson placed. And then after that, there's, oh, there's a guy in the NCAA finals. There's six and seven wrestlers qualifying most things in school history. Of course, we know the demise of the program being what it is. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that, but when did you start getting the calls to be like, okay, and, and realizing that as a coach, you've, you've kind of arrived on the scene. People know who Mike Dixon is. He's not just the guy making sure Steve is okay with the compliance handbook. <laughs> yeah. uh, coaching, especially college coaching, because you're dealing with recruiting, uh, a lot of it's relational, building and creating relationships. You got to do it with high school parents, high school kids. Uh, you got to do it with colleagues. Uh, you got to do it with administrators. So there's different buckets that you have to be able to develop and create relationships with. And um, I guess I've been pretty fortunate that I've been able uh, to do that. And I guess pretty decently, um, you know, and that that's what I've kind of tried to do my whole life. Um, and, you know, when we talk about success, um, the way I view success is when, when a kid enters a program four or five years later, is this kid, in a better position than when he started. And I, I think at uh, Old Dominion, we were able to do that at a very, very high level. You know, we had some at-risk kids uh, that were able to take on. And uh, in other circumstances, they probably wouldn't have obtained degrees. And, you know, who knows uh, what path they would have gone down had they not given that opportunity. Um, you know, we recruited, we were finally able to get to the point where we actually could get some high level kids. Cause my first, probably two or three years, every phone call was, you know, OD who are you guys division one? Where are you located? You know, so by the I, beach, I, <laughs> I, I would sell the beach a lot. I would well, it was kind beach. of an oversell because, you know, having spent seven years as an undergrad there, that's, it's not on the beach. It's not like I have to well, worry about well, recruiting anybody to that place now, but it's, it's, well, it's a 15 true. minute ride. Hey, it, it, it's a short ride to the beach on recruiting trips. Everybody saw the beach. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah. but I, I, I was glad when recruits stopped asking me those questions, I was like, Oh, we must be get, actually getting better because they're not asking me every division one anymore. You know, um, you know, in old dominion, we, we, uh, w the level we were trying to get at, um, we knew we had to tap into the Midwest a lot. And, uh, I guess kind of go back into relationships. Um, I had ties, uh, to coaches in Indiana, Illinois, um, I didn't have any ties to the East coast. And I realized very, very quickly that being on the East coast, you better develop some East coast ties. Um, so that's where we kind of got our foray into, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, and I, I <clears throat> Lee Pritz is probably, he's probably one of the best recruiters I've ever been around, to be honest with you. And Pritz knows probably, probably anybody. In the everybody. <laughs> yeah. He, he knows everybody. So, um, I mean, if, if Ken Cherto has everybody's email address, Pritz has everybody's phone number. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. That's pretty accurate. You know, and obviously you can see the uh, recruits they get over at Arizona state. You know, I'm sure Lee's hand is heavily involved with probably the majority of them. Um, but you know, it's creating relationships and then, and then being able to get kids, you got to show the athlete, the parent and the coach that they can trust you, you know, that, uh, you actually have the kid's best interest out at heart. And it's not just about trying to win a bunch of matches that the, there's other things outside of wrestling that we want to help, you know, your, your child develop. And I, I, I think especially at your mid major and smaller programs, you, that's the part you really have to sell because everybody's career comes to an end at one point or another, you know, no matter how high level you are or 
you know, whether you're just fighting for a spot on the team, everybody's career is going to come to the end, and it's all these other things that hopefully you've learned and developed through wrestling, through wrestling practice. Um, are you able to apply those things to life? You know, and I've been fortunate enough that wrestling has taught me a lot. It showed me a lot. And as a coach, you just try to pass those things on uh, to a number of your athletes. And um, like I said, ho- hopefully uh, the athletes that I've been able to uh, uh, be in touch with, uh, ho- hopefully I was able to help benefit them a little bit. And, you know, like I said, we've placed a number of athletes in terms of jobs um, and a lot of them are off great, very successful doing great things. And, uh, you know, that, that's really all you can ask. So having the opportunity to go back to your alma mater is one thing, but before we, we get to the move back to the Midwest, well, what was your response? I mean, this is, this is, I mean, you, you, co- you, you, know, you were on the ODU Matt cast, the show that I did for ODU for years. Obviously everybody knows that I'm an alum and uh, you know, I kind of wear that on my sleeve and looking at, the, the reaction, I mean, were, were you surprised? What were some things that, that kind of struck you as really odd about the decision to cut wrestling there? Uh, I got a text. Um, and I don't remember exactly the exact day, but I remember I got a text from, uh, it was actually from Pat Papalizio. He said, hey, I'm hearing something. You know, um, so I said, well, let me get back to you. I was like, no, nah, that can't be true. You know, I, I figured over to you, uh, you would have heard something. And uh, in, in terms of budgets and stuff, I, I, I knew what the funding was. And anytime you're at Olympic sport, uh, you always know in the back of your mind, it, it's always a possibility that being an Olympic sport, you could get dropped. But uh, ODU wrestling was a, a uh, for the level we were at, we were a pretty uh, well-funded uh, program. You know, so I was like, no, nah, that can't be true. That can't be true. I mean, the new wrestling room, it, it, they spent the money to renovate and create a new wrestling room. Uh, biggest crowds in school history in that tenure. Most All-Americans in school. I mean, more than half of the All-Americans are on Steve's watch in terms of who the head coach is. Uh, you know, you're talking about the program started in 1958 uh, under Pete Robinson and, you know, of the number of all Americans, more than half are Steve's and there's been, you know, seven coaches or actually five coaches, if, if my math's right. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at it as like, you've invested all this time and effort into this program and it's provide, you know, once, you know, cause when, when I was there, we had what, six and a half in-state rides, no full-time assistant. So there's, a, there's no obvious reasons why you weren't getting any, any all Americans and you were, you were struggling sure. to beat George Mason, uh, you know, with res, no, no disrespect to Frank Beasley. But the, the point is, is once you put some, some resources into the program, oh, I don't know, the success started. I mean, Ryan Williams is wrestling in the finals of, of the NCAA tournament. That's happened only twice in school history. So, um, you know, I could, we, again, we could speak for hours on this, but from a, from a coaching standpoint, have you been there? Did, I mean, I've I've been pretty much shut out by the administration and the athletic administration. Did did uh, did that actions knowing that you know what I've tried to to explore kind of surprise you on the, on the side of uh, how Wood Seelig and his staff have handled this? Uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it... <laughs> it's obviously not the point of this interview. And uh, I mean, hey, yeah, you're not in college um... athletics anymore. <laughs> right, screw um... them. <laughs> I, I'm saying that. That's not you. <laughs> So, um, like I said, go, going back to being an Olympic sport, you always know there's a possibility that one day you you get that phone call, and obviously you never hope it's anybody, mm-hmm. you know. Um, administrators can make the decisions that they make, and they, they could feel it's what's in their uh, best interest. And obviously I don't agree with it, you don't agree with it. Um, but – Um, especially being in 2020, um, is this the right call, um, to be able to say in order to perform at whatever level we want as a athletic department, we need to get rid of these 30 student athletes or this program. A lot of first generation Um, college students there. And uh, if math serves me, seven of the 10 starters were African-American or or people of color. And that's also, you know, the the demographic and diversity of ODU wrestling was really unlike any other team in Division I. Correct. Yes, yes. We were able to recruit a lot of kids that, um, to be honest with you, had had they not um, gone to college and probably specifically to ODU, 
Um, who knows what opportunities they would have had. And like I said, some of those kids were high risk kids, at risk kids. Uh, some of those were high financial need kids that uh, we were fortunate Old Dominion uh, had some pretty good financial aid packages where we could get a lot of kids that had high financial need and get them to a place where uh, they didn't have to pay much, if anything at all, kind of depending upon their particular situation. Um, you know, and you wonder now with that program being gone, um, are you taking away opportunities uh, with that? And, and I just think the mission of a college and the mission of an athletic department is obviously to help serve a certain segment of the population in a certain community. And uh, with all these ever increasing profits, um, is that really the goal? And every athletic department can't operate in the same way. You know, obviously you, You've got your large athletic departments, your Ohio States, uh, your Alabamas, your Texas. Their goals and missions are going to be a little bit different than a school like an Old Dominion, you know, whereas um, winning national championships consistently across the board at a, at a mid-major school, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it, it's not realistic. But you can still put together extremely competitive teams and you can have uh, people – that can do great things and excel at a high level. But I mean, obviously you got to get the right people in place. Um, and I think at, at the time we did have a, a fantastic thing rolling at old you, you know, we were pretty consistently in the top 25 uh, probably every other year we had somebody uh, on the podium. We were consistently producing academic all Americans. We were graduating our student athletes. Um, you know, they were staying out of trouble. Um, you know, I mean, they were doing what typical college kids do. But, um, you know, like I said, it's trying to get them in the right direction. I, I, I think your Olympic sports, those are the kids that really are kind of fulfilling uh, the need of the university. And uh, to be honest with you, in, in terms of um, many years down the road, when you want that support and that donation, um, the Olympic sports are consistently the ones – that are supporting the programs in terms of donations uh, given back from alumni. Um, so I, I, I just think a lot of times uh, these universities, obviously, I mean, you've had big 10 PAC 12 schools uh, drop sports, which I think is very, very unfortunate. And like I said, that, that could be a completely different show. Uh, but I, I, I think administrators really need to delve into what exactly is our mission and how do we serve that mission? Um, you know, instead of just, um, Hey, we're trying to win a bunch of football games. Cause it, it, it appears that a lot of the decisions are just driven by one sport, which football brings in the majority of revenue. We, we all understand that wrestlers get it, that, you know, they're the ones that are going to eat first, you know, but, um, and I, I think you might've even, uh, tweeted this out the other day. It was an article talking about how much, uh, excess there is with football, um, you know, the, the staying the night before at hotels and that all of a sudden that's become a common practice. Um, yeah, I think I saw a stat that Georgia tech spent like $5,000 the day before a game on equipment to rent equipment at a hotel, a mile away from their campus. And it's equipment they actually owned at their own place. So, I mean, there's that there's the, the, I mean, here's the thing. I, here's what I don't understand about, um, the, again, I, I call it the cast system of college sports. I'll get us back on track to you and beat the street Chicago here soon. I, I, I promise. I promise. It's like, you know, the name, image, and likeness. And, you know, it's the, the cost of attendance was one thing that I was thinking. I was like, wait, they're already on a full, like say the, 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 the lineman who, who might, might be on what the hands team who plays three downs in his career gets four years of five years of school paid for. Whereas the wrestler, like I've seen it, my roommates were those people who is a four time national, national qualifier on not even full ride uh you know try you know we're we're try, we're using coffee filters for you know what we're, we don't ha you know we're we're having to work at some pretty pretty sketchy kind of places just to get some jobs i mean uh you know some of us were bouncers some of us uh worked for you know places across the street to exterminate you know who i'm talking about what up charlie uh you know i mean a lot of <laughs> a lot of places that you know people talk about oh athletes can't have jobs well 
we had to have jobs to pay. You know, it's like one thing. It's like okay, the haves and the have-nots. I mean, it's I could go on again another soapbox about that. But again, the access, the well, but uh, and then the well, non-revenue. You don't make any money. Well, y- you do if you look at the math outside of the athletic department ledger. That kid that's coming to school paying tuition that makes money for the school. So anyway, that's that's again beating beating the drum of people that already you know. If you're going to agree with me, you're already agreeing with me. If you disagree, I'm not going to change your mind. So. <laughs> Moving on from that crap stain in Norfolk, Virginia, Beat the Street Chicago, a shining opportunity for you coming off of a, they had a big event, the Rumble on the Rooftop, and this one surprised me. And I, you, you signed up for my newsletter, and I see M. Dixon at <laughs> BTS Chicago. I was like, what? Because you had just left to go back to your alma mater. That's like one of those, like, it's one of those dream situations, you know, it's the only job you'd leave. Is for your alma mater. So, I mean, the opportunity to, to – h- how do you leave, you know, a spot that you had left? You know, you'd already made one big move. So uh, explain how yeah. the Beat the Street Chicago thing kind of <laughs> unfolded. Uh, well, to give you the short version. Uh, <laughs> the short, short version. No, no. Spaceballs was um, on the other day. Anyway, I digress. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I, I was not seeking a job at all. Um, you know, obviously the pandemic had hit and – you know, we're in month, whatever of quarantine. And, and, uh, uh, I guess to go back a little bit, uh, so me and Mike Powell were teammates at Indiana. Um, you know, so I, I, I've known Powell since, uh, the mid nineties, uh, and Mike Powell, obviously, um, he's got his own personal story, which I'm sure many people are well aware of and know, um, you know, he's a successful high school coach at Oak Park River Forest. Uh, and it, it took me forever to actually get a couple of his kids, but I was finally able to get, grab a couple of his kids at uh, Old Dominion. Um, but I can't remember how the first call took place or whatever, but then uh, we just kind of started talking. And uh, at first I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, that sounds good, but – um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I was fully engaged in beat the street Chicago. And uh, to be honest with you, I didn't know a whole lot about it. Uh, you know, I mean, you see stuff on the internet and, um, you see what some of the other beat the streets organizations do. Um, but like you said, I, I was at a good spot and, uh, at Indiana, I, I think we had put the foundation in place, um, where this could have been a very special year in terms of uh, finally fielding a team that was pretty competitive with uh, a lot of the big tip programs. Um, you know, we, we had some eager, hungry people, uh, people that were excited uh, to wrestle and compete at a high level. And I think we had finally developed some depth at uh, weight classes uh, where a lot of those things uh, could happen for kids to have success. Uh but as I continued to talk to Powell, I started, and I don't know what caused me to tick, but finally I was like, let me actually do some research. Um, so I started making phone calls. Uh, you know, I, I talked to several people. I talked to several people that work in nonprofit. I talked to several people that work in other Beat the Streets organizations. Uh, I talked to several people that are actually close friends of Powell just to kind of you know, let me get the full picture of this. Uh, but, you know, P- Powell, he, he's very passionate about impacting and changing lives. Um, and you can see he did that at Oak Park. He took a lot of at-risk kids that uh, otherwise not given the opportunity, who knows where they've been, and was able to get those kids successfully into college, a lot of them to successful predominant, you know, Big Ten schools, Pac-12 schools, and a lot of those kids have had success in college and uh, a lot of them are successful have college degrees uh, and are being productive members of society. These are kids that had Powell not kind of taken an interest and passion in them. Who knows if that same opportunity uh, would have been given to him. Uh, he's kind of devoted all that time and energy into impacting not just kids that are in the OPRF, district, but within the city of Chicago. And I I think with this pandemic, you can kind of see that um, there's a lot of things going on in this country um, that probably we need to address. But uh, getting involved 
with kids that have a lot of needs or at risk. I think that's a lot of the ways and one of the few ways that you can actually solve this problem. And, you know, that's what the goal of this organization is, is to, uh, number one, it's a youth development organization. And it's basically, we're trying to change lives uh, within the city of Chicago. And just kind of the, the more I thought about it, the more I talked, I was like, this is kind of what I do anyway, you know, but at, at, when you get kids that come to college, you know, you, you're kind of dealing with kids that um, people have helped them get to a certain point or they're just the top of, you know, the, the, the top 1% of the class anyway. But there are so many kids that may not have the opportunity to wrestle at a Division One college or even go to college, but they still need that impact. Um, you know, in, in Chicago during this pandemic, you know, they've had their problems and They've had the problems before the pandemic, you know. Uh, I, I was born outside of Chicago uh, originally many, many moons ago. Um, but, you know, murder and crime in the city of Chicago, obviously, that grabs a lot of headlines. <laughs> that grabs the headline. I've been waiting for that. Murder in Chicago. And now, yeah, anyway. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so let's, let's go back to that. I just, I've been saving that. I didn't realize it was going to uh, pop up like that. <laughs> sure you did. <laughs> um, but, I mean, sh- Chicago's a gorgeous city. I, I, I love Chicago. Um, I'm a huge Cubs fan. You know, you've mentioned that before. Go but, Cubs, go. Uh, go P- Cubs, go. That's right. Hey, Chicago, w- what do you say? <laughs> I think the Cubs are going to win today. I think, isn't that how it goes? Uh, that was your ringtone forever. Uh, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Um, but but I, I just think, so the state of Illinois has got a lot of wrestling, and, and the wrestling's in the Chicago area. You know, and that's some of the best wrestling in the country. Um, but can we have that impact on the inner city in terms of wrestling at a high level, but not only wrestling at a high level, but – being able to impact kids to where by the time they graduate high school, they have options to start a successful career, start some type of schooling education, or, you know, possibly go to the military, you know, so you, you want to be able to give kids options so that they can be productive members of society because everybody wants to be a part of something, you know, and, uh, the people that don't have the opportunity to be a part of something, they will be a part of something, whether it's good or bad. You know what I'm saying? Um, so we want to be an organization that is changing the lives of good people. And I actually had this conversation uh, uh, probably about two hours ago today um, with one of the athletes here at in Indiana. Um, you know, he he, he was – I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this a little bit. I mean, I'm not going to say his name, but he, he's in – at risk kid, but he did enough to at least get himself in a position where he had the opportunity to wrestle at a uh, division one school, you know? So, you know, I was kind of talking to him. I said, Hey, I'm going to be working with a lot of kids that are just like you, you know? And I said, Hey, I'm going to be picking your brain throughout the year because there's stuff that, cause I was fortunate enough. I haven't lived that life, you know, but it's, there's a lot of people that do live that life. And I, I think, in order to help society, we need to get more people involved that can help the people that aren't as fortunate, that don't have a, access to a number of things that probably a lot of us take for granted. You know, and there are things that I probably take for granted that, oh, I didn't even realize that. Uh, I can remember going back to my Indianapolis days. Um, I used to help substitute teach um, at the inner city schools there were called the Indianapolis Public Schools. And my first day substitute teaching, because my experience is I, I went to in Indianapolis, you either went to an inner city school or you went to a township school. I went to a township school. You know, you had your own books that you took home and, you know, you assigned homework and yada, yada, yada. You know, I mean, probably what you would consider. Yeah, what most normal, people think is school. A normal experience. Well, my first day teaching, there was a classroom set of books. And I was looking around. I'm like, classroom set? I'm like, well, how do the kids do homework? And it was like, whatever they get done here, that's what they do. You know, so you you start seeing stuff like that where, so a kid that goes to an inner city school, he doesn't even have the opportunity to read and do those things at his 
his or her own home because for whatever reason, but the school, the school district, whatever, is not providing enough something as simple as books so that kids can do that. Because who knows how many Rhodes Scholar, you know, scholarship, uh, academic scholarship um, kids you could have if you do something as simple as just provide those kids with their Mm -hmm. own set of books so they're able to take them and able to excel at their own. Because it's hard for me to excel at pick a subject if I only have the resource to be successful at that for 40 minutes a day versus the kid that's 10, 15 miles down the road from me, he's got access to that nine months a year. Whenever he chooses to open the book, he can do that. Yeah. And as kid, an example, like, uh, you know, using, using my own kids as an example, my, my third grader, her assignment, one of her assignments is read for 20 minutes a day. We got plenty of books for her to read. I mean, she's got, right. and then her school has, they've ga- they gave her a Chromebook to use for this, this hybrid learning model, this distance learning thing and, and a program to access books like uh, this thing called Epic. So I'm just thinking about comparing what you're saying to what, you know, I didn't experience that, but my child, I'm going through looking, going, wow. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, kids right now don't have what, I mean, we're, we're giving this to a third grader and Hey, here's all the resources you need. And yeah, again, we take it for granted. Like, okay, people don't have that. It's just so we, 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 you know, sometimes we're like, well, how come they can't do this? We had this. No, they didn't have this. Yeah. yeah. Not, not everybody has access to the same resources and, and that's unfortunate. And you know, like the internet, I mean, I, you know, people f- flip out about buffering on Netflix. Some people, <laughs> yeah, some people don't I mean, have to go to McDonald's to do their homework. If yeah. they, if they have the opportunity to do homework. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, and, and I think, we have to do a better job as a country just understanding that everybody has a different experience in life and we need to be empathetic to said experience. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't find a common ground and common good to come together because uh, everybody wants to be a productive member of society. Like, I mean, I don't think anybody is like, hey, I want to do a bunch of bad stuff in life, you know. There's people uh, but, on Twitter that I, I think are are, are, are <laughs> in that world, but uh, general, I think I think you would be generally correct with that statement. Most people, yeah, you know, but but being able to give everybody the same access to the same resources, and like I said, something as simple as books, everybody doesn't have that, you know. And I mean, if you grew up and you know you don't read at home because you don't have access to books you're going to find other things to do, you know, and some of those other things aren't necessarily good for you. So um, I, I, I think being able to help kids and uh, fortunate enough that I've been able to probably help some kids that otherwise probably would have been in the street. Cause I know they have had some friends that uh, didn't lead a good life. And uh, some of those people are, are dead, uh, you know, um, but fortunately they are not, you know, they, they, like I said, but they were given an opportunity through wrestling, uh, to be able to get a college degree. And, you know, like I said, they're successful. They have jobs now, but, uh, I, I guess beat the streets. It, it's a broader organization, uh, where we could touch many, many lives. And, you know, that's kind of the goal. That's the impact to basically change kids lives through wrestling though. You know, Powell is always quick to mention we're going to be good at wrestling too. Yeah. So, no, the, the um, question is, is, is those, re, you know, talk about those resources and, you know, Chicago's a big city and then the suburbs are sprawling. Basically. I mean, you hit suburban Chicago when you cross in from Wisconsin. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where you've got the entire, you, you've got a lot of area to cover where, where's BTS Chicago kind of headquartered for, you know, for example, like my, my buddy was a Chicago police, uh, police officer department of investigation. It was required that he lived within the city limits. It's not like you've got, you know, as part of BTS Chicago, you're going to be, you're going to be in the city. You're going to be right there going 30 miles an hour and take you three hours to go 15 minutes. So, um, the, the, the you traffic know. wasn't bad. I was up there. This weekend. <laughs> the traffic was not that bad. Uh, uh, now I, I was very upset. The, fir- the first day I was in Chicago, uh, this week, it was 58 degrees when I stepped out the car and all I, I mean, I've lived in Virginia for what, 14, 15 years. I'm used to shorts and flip flops. So, I was wearing shorts and flip flops. <laughs> I'm wearing shorts and flip flops right now, although it is so, it is 80 in Minnesota at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So. well, it, it got nice for the weekend, but the first day I'm there, it's 58 degrees. I'm like, what is this? You know, so I 
I, I tell people I, I'm moving to Chicago at the absolute worst time of the year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah, Bears football season. <laughs> well, November through about April is not hot. I Chicago. just know that the. I mean, I I live in Minnesota, and the coldest I've ever been is any year at the Midlands. It's just it's like it's like the 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 windy city. It's like, yep, welcome to Chicago, uh, DX style. But uh, point I was getting at is uh, one thing that we, we've kind of lost too is the the community colleges that used to have wrestling in Chicago no longer exist for for those sports. And uh, have you given much thought to what what we can do for you know the kid that maybe needs a you know the the high school rough around the edges kid that you say that's definitely not ready to go to Bloomington for example he's not ready to go to Champaign uh he may not be ready to go to 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 McHenry but you know give a, a junior college atmosphere or something to maybe pick up that slack that they didn't have as you talked about some of these kids that didn't have it when you were substitute teaching those opportunities how, what are some things i mean your titles in Richmond so mm-hmm. I'm I'm guessing there's there's things in the works to to bridge gaps and stuff. But have you given any thought to the lack of the junior college opportunity and maybe what Beat the Streets Chicago can do for for that kid that's not ready for a a huge environment when everything they know maybe just one neighborhood compared to like a a giant giant school. Yeah. So um, I've always said that not everybody needs to go to college. Not everybody is prepared to go to college and college isn't for everybody, you know? So uh, when we talk about school, schooling can be a trade school. Uh, look at be, the apprentice school. That was, yeah, you know, in, yes. you know, you're, you know, you're building it doesn't ships. Have to be, <laughs> right. It doesn't have to be a four year degree at this big time university where, you know, I accumulate a bunch of debt, you know, um, obviously there are blue collar jobs, white collar jobs. I mean, like I said, it's all about being a productive member of society and the lessons you learn from wrestling, applying that to life. Um, But obviously in in this world, you want to be able to get kids to be able to critically think. Now that doesn't necessarily have to come in the classroom setting that can come through life. Um, But at least giving them the opportunity to have access to further education, I think is important. Like I said, whether it's community college, uh, trade schools, or what what uh, what have you, but uh, getting kids to understand that they're uh, graduating high school is it's a starting point. It's it's not an end point. It's just a starting point, and now we're going to keep building. And I think that's uh, kind of what we want to work on, especially with this pandemic going on. And uh, Chicago is probably a little bit more shut down than most other areas in the country. Uh, We're going to have to be very creative with um, how we uh, impact kids right now because um, how much of it is going to be wrestling based early on. I don't know, to be honest with you, you know, obviously that's going to be up to um, medical professionals and, you know, the city of Chicago in terms of what can and can't happen. But um, as, as, as soon as we are ready to uh, start mixing in the wrestling piece, we want to do that. But uh, kind of going back to what you asked where it was. So uh, Beat the Street Chicago actually recently just purchased a building over by Midway Airport. So, And I believe we are the only Beat the Streets organization with their own facility. Um, so I was up there this weekend uh, to help do a clean out. We did some demo work. Um, and they're basically going to kind of rehab this building a little bit. And, uh, it's, I, I can't tell you the square footage, but it's going to have two wrestling rooms. It's going to have a weight room. It's going to have a classroom setting. Um, you know, our job is to fill kids with programming, you know, and, and especially, you know, we're on month six or seven of this pandemic. Uh, <laughs> you know, people are looking for things to do. Uh, we want to be able to provide that, uh, specifically, obviously to the neighborhoods that critically need it. But, um, you know, we want to be an open avenue to anybody within the city of Chicago or within the suburbs, but we want to make sure we have an impact directly with the kids that uh, we live in that community so we can serve that specific uh, community and the surrounding communities. In your, your few short weeks on the job, have you reached out to the other Beat the Streets chapters? Uh, they're, 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 you know, related, but they're not directly connected. Uh, what, what are some things that you've maybe heard from, from what, uh, what they're doing out in New York, what they're doing in LA, Baltimore, uh, Cleveland, you know, places that have had these, these Beat the Streets chapters for a couple of years? Uh, so I, I actually haven't, uh, 
when I was doing my research about this position, I did reach out to Yavru. I reached out to Buckley at Beat the Streets LA in uh, New York. Um, but I have not uh, reached out to them since accepting the job. But that is something further on down the road I do plan on doing. Uh, right now, I'm still... You're swinging a hammer right now. <laughs> <laughs> doing some uh, hard labor. Uh, this weekend... Uh, Powell was able to uh, get a lot of volunteers and uh, they have a, a young professionals group of some former college wrestlers and uh, they did the lion's share of the work. So if they see this or if they're listening right now, thank you very much for all that hard work. Cause I certainly couldn't do it all, but uh, we had some hammers out there. Um, but I'm still in transition because I actually, I'm, I'm still in Bloomington um, right now. Um, but you know, I'm back and forth a little bit, you know, basically on weekends, I head up to Chicago and uh, try and get my feet wet uh, there. I'm still trying to find a place to live, uh, to be honest with you. So it's, uh, it's busy right now, but it's good, you know, and at the same time, uh, trying to be able to help the uh, Indiana program as best I can or uh, where they see fit for me. Uh, Angel has been very, very gracious um, during this transition and I, I couldn't have asked to uh, work for a better boss uh, than Angel. Uh, he's very humble. Uh, somebody that wrestles at such a high level, he, he's a very humble athlete, a uh, very personable athlete. Um, I was fortunate enough that he was able to hire me. Uh, you know, in uh, the two years we worked together, although uh, it probably wasn't the timeline that he'd wanted, nor nor myself, Uh it, it, it was definitely a good experience, and, uh, you know, Angel's been nothing but first class, and he runs a first class program, and I'm r- rooting the best uh, for all those guys, and I know he'll find somebody uh, that will do great things and probably a lot better than what I, I, could, I could do at Indiana. But like I said, the foundation has uh, been laid, and I'm, I'm excited to watch from a different perspective uh, in, in terms of what Indiana can do and what the future holds over there. Yeah, and just in case you were wondering, you can find out more information at btschicago.org. If I was prepared, I'd have that up on the screen for you if you're watching. But if you're not watching, well, it's <clears throat> btschicago.org on that thing we call the the interweb. So, Mike, in, in the time we got left, uh, a- any final thoughts about uh, this this move for you? Uh, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of things, a lot of things still yet to be done. As you said, you still got to actually get there. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's that whole physicality, you know, localization thing that you're working on. But uh, yeah, you know, there's 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 a lot been a lot of topics in wrestling and such, and you know, any anything left that you want to touch on before uh, I, I throw old, old photoshops up at you again? No, oh boy. <laughs> no, I mean, I I, I just. I, I I hope we have wrestling season. To be honest with you, you know, um, I I go. think. Oh boy! <laughs> so let's let's just um, talk. Yeah, okay. Real quick, this 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 was a picture uh, I took with my old old flip phone at the CAA tournament. I want to say two thousand six. Oh wow! At Drexel, <laughs> and um, this was the tie you were wearing, and uh, then you decided to wear it on your head, and you had gotten rid of the. Uh, gotten rid of the mustache and this was actually on your office wall for how many years printed it somebody printed it out i don't know if you i doubt you did it but somebody put this i think i think sarita's printed it out yeah (laughs) because i I remember going in there and it was it was there so yeah Yeah. that's the uh the the no mustache edition so of the the ninja turtles so anyway i've been i didn't mean to put that up in your 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 deeply heartfelt message about chicago so now it's we can um (laughs) A little loosen it up because I might print this out and put it on my wall now because uh, <laughs> nothing else from that era is on the wall really because uh, <laughs> it would it would be an honor to be on your wall. Well, well, remember the last time you were in my basement, it didn't end up so well for you. <laughs> that's, that's too many adult beverages. That's, that, that was uh, when you re- recruit Minnesota kids. You know, be be prepared. I'll throw in the boots. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll bur- I barely for I almost forgot about that. Maybe I'll tell I'll get Laval to tell that story too. That, but, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. Is uh, when when I'm throwing you know not a whole lot of maybe that you shouldn't have put. Uh, yeah, that's definitely not on the resume. I had the boots thrown in now. Anyway, uh, we're, we're going to keep that one off. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Anyway, that that'll wrap up episode six eighteen of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. I'd like to thank you guys out there watching. 
on the live version on Rockfin or on Facebook Live via the Speakeasy Live here in the Speakeasy. So for Mike Dixon, I'm Jason Bryant, and thank you for spending your time with me because you've always got time for short time. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Sportswear. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. Hey, you know what? Did you like the show? You want to hit that subscribe button? MattTalkOnline.com slash listen. Various different ways to subscribe to this show on your favorite podcatcher of choice. And if you're already subscribed and you're already listening and you love the show and you want to support this show and this network, MattTalkOnline.com slash join the team. Become a team member today.